you know, I think to start with, when we explain the chimp, it's, it's very easy to get the wrong impression and think, oh, Christ, this chimp's really bad. I don't like to stigmatize the chimp. The chimp is just a part of our mind. Just a part of our mind that thinks emotionally. And at times it can be unhelpful what it offers, but it's just an offer all the same. I personally like to think it was, you know, when you've got them friends who, they're your friends, they're good people, you know you hang out with them for a reason, but sometimes they can just be a bit... A bit too much. Yeah, just like, what? That didn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you overreacting for? Yeah. So, yeah. But they're still your friends. And I think mm. that's what we've got. We've got a system in our brain that doesn't know what it's like to live in society. It doesn't get it. It lives by its jungle rules. And if we further stigmatise that part of the brain, if we further neglect it, don't accept it, don't try and work with it, we're making it more difficult to live in harmony with it. Welcome to the Mentality Podcast. We're recording at the incredible Wheatwood Hall Hotel Podcast Studio. This is a podcast that goes way beyond stigma. We talk about men's mental health and mindset. We encourage the type of conversation that will open you up to another way to live life, another way to see yourself and the world around you. If you are ready for that, you're in the right place. I'm Stevie Ward and I'm an ex professional rugby league player and captain and now I guess I'm a bit of a podcaster, a speaker, actor, writer, entrepreneur. I'm still working all that out but at Mentality we help men take control of their mindset by teaching them to find purpose, resilience and what I believe is the new success inner peace. That sounds good. If you are that guy who is waking up to the fact that they need to do something different in life and the same old habits aren't working for you, it might be time to step up. If you want to start your journey with us, you can go to mentality.co.uk forward slash coaching to join the best team you have ever seen. Ben, how are you doing, mate? Thanks for coming on the Mentality Podcast today. Thank you for having me, Stevie. Yeah, I'm well, thanks. What a time to be alive. I'm in shorts and I'm in Manchester. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Mate, it, um, we chatted a little bit about maybe doing it in physical, but the ease of sitting into a podcast with the virtual world is obviously all the more prevalent these days. But um, yeah, thanks for, for joining us, mate, from Ben Harper. Good old Ben Harper linking us up. Um, the physio at... Team GB Taekwondo and obviously you are the Team GB Taekwondo's sports psychologist so it's great to have you on mate and getting into the the psychology game getting into that um, sort of way to look at mental health and way to manage it and train it what's your story like what's how did you get into it what sort of got your interest in in that world yeah well I think First important to say, privilege, privilege to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Stevie. And a uh, nice little name drop to Ben there. I said I'd get that in for him as well. <laughs> yeah. um, he's relying on that. I'll be seeing him tomorrow, so you'll, That's be, it. you'll be asking about it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, my, my journey into psychology really is, it's not, it's not overly exciting. I suppose uh, as a teenager, I played a lot of sport, uh, Took education up um, in, in college, did, did PE, took A-level psychology. Always sort of had a fascination about, you know, what motivates people to behave in certain ways. And yeah, the, the, the A-level psychology course was a catalyst, really. I thought, oh, there's something here, something in this. If I'm honest, it, it asked more questions than it answered. <laughs> mm, that's true. Um, and then I naturally thought, okay, there's something in this. So university found sports psychology uh, as a degree and then just followed the sort of linear path up really the sports psychology undergrad postgrad and then on to my two years supervised training before getting chartered that's it that's it and and so you, you practice um i'm not i'm not sure what to coin it or what to call it but or the, the method or the practice of chimp chimp management if you call it that how did you get involved in, in doing that work? Well, it sounds like a, a lifetime ago now, but um, 
Just to clear it up, Chip, Chip Management is the name of a company that Professor Steve Peters is the CEO of. Uh, people might know Professor Steve Peters as being the author of the best-selling book, The Chimp Paradox. Um, again, not a, an overly flattering sort of story into that, really. Saw a job advertised, applied for it, and got it. Was very fortunate enough to get it um, and joined Steve and the team. Chimp Management's an organization that includes loads of psychologists, psychiatrists, psychological skills mentors, um, and we work in all sorts of areas and disciplines, really. Anything from sport, corporate, health, uh, the emergency services, even Joe Blogs on the street, you know, doing one-to-one -one self development. What we aim to do is help individuals gain insights and understandings about how their mind works using this this roadmap that the chimp model offers and teach them tools teach them tools of how to better manage their mind to achieve whatever whatever outcomes they're after yeah and what is what is could you give us a rundown on what the chimp management roadmap is <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll try my best i'll try my best i mean i think it's important to start with by saying it, it's it's a working model of the mind you know there's a lot of different working models out there it's not to say it's the it's the be-all and end-all. It's the holy grail. What it is, is it's an integrative model that combines a lot of other psychological schools of thought that have come before it. So you might be familiar with models of psychology like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, psychodynamic approach, uh, existential psychology. Uh, what the CHIMP model does is it, it integrates all of these models and the, the bit that it adds on, which is, is new, and as far as I know, exclusive to the chimp model is, is what neuroscience is teaching us now. When we get the brain under an MRI scanner, we find that there are different circuits at play when we think, feel, and behave. And there's a large circuitry that, that operates outside of our conscious awareness, and it's able to independently think. I'm going to pause for effect with that bit because I think that is quite poignant and that's quite important and on the premise of the chimp paradox what we're saying is that we essentially live with another person within us who doesn't think like us doesn't operate like us and doesn't follow life by the same agenda so it's, it's integrative in that it combines those different approaches, but it's, it's novel in that it's the first of its kind to actually appreciate that we have another independently thinking brain in our mind. So if we use an example like, I don't know, what's a good example? Okay, I've just had lunch. So let's use food. That could be a good one. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we, the human beings, rationally, logically speaking, we have a certain attitude and approach towards food. You know, we might think we're only going to eat enough to get by. Um, we're going to eat to serve the purposes of what we're trying to achieve. So if we're an elite athlete, we're obviously going to stick within a certain calories. We're going to eat certain foods, not eat certain foods. Some of them. Some of them, exactly. <laughs> I, I did recall actually our phone call a couple of weeks ago where I met you, well, I spoke to you over the phone and you were halfway through some fish and chips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I, that's um, that's something that's coming post post playing that. It's me old. I was with my old man, um, obviously painting a house, um, doing a bit of that. <laughs> and fish and chips comes with that territory, I guess. So to fit in, I uh, allowed myself to have um, fish and chips for lunch, which I, I mentioned to you, Ben. Then I? I mentioned that that. There was there was there was a conversation in my mind. I don't know if it's with the chimp that you're talking about or whether it's with the the Stevie Ward that exists that I feel like is my beliefs and values. And it was almost a, a negotiation to think, right, okay, well, is that Stevie Ward going to allow fish and chips at lunchtime, um, knowing that I'm going to feel like rubbish in two hours? And then I thought, well, you know what? Yeah, I'm not I'm not playing. I'm not staying to wait, or I'm not. I don't need to think too much about it. So like, yeah, go on, Dad. You can you can get me fish and chips if you want. <laughs> so but anyway. I'm a that, big fan I'm a big fan, Stevie. I was incredibly jealous when I was over the phone thinking, yeah. there's <laughs> sandwiches and you're having fish and chips. Um, you, could think, have, you could have helped us paint that wall, mate. <laughs> that, that that would have evened it out. I think your example is a really good one to display 
you know, the, the mind can be at harmony with itself or it can be in conflict. Mm. You know, and in that situation you just said there, actually, when you thought about it, it's in harmony. You're saying to yourself, look, I've grafted, I've put in the work, you know, I'm not an elite athlete where I have to constantly be vigilant and monitor my diet and my weight. I'm going to have fish and chips. So what? And that's a personal preference. I'm not here to say what you should and shouldn't eat. But if we reflect on it when it's not in harmony, it's in conflict, we live with an emotionally thinking mind. We've, we've named it the chimp. It's a part of the brain that we share with the greater apes. And if we think about food through that lens, food is survival. So, so we got to eat. You know, and every time we see food, we, we purge. You know, we, we have loads, sorry. We, we get it down us so that, you know, we're, we're alive and we stay safe and, and we don't know when the next feed's going to come. So to the, the chimp brain, that's normal, that's healthy. But living in society where food is readily available for a lot of us um, and a lot of the food that we can get is maybe very calorific and, and not that good for us physiologically, you know, we, we have a... We have a conflict now where the human in us is going, well, I don't think we need to eat that much. I don't think we need to eat those types of things. But the chimp's going, I don't care what you want. I'm going to eat. And this is, you know, I work in a a sport like Taekwondo, which is obviously weight managed. And people fight in different weight categories. And this is, you know, a really big stressor, sense of internal conflict with a lot of the athletes. I'm sure it's the same in, in the likes of boxing and other sports as well. There's like if you could think about it is you've got the the chimp sort of part of the brain which is I don't know if it's the limbic brain or the other, sort of old reptilian brain which is another a way to look at it but then as we've evolved and sort of moved further away from being just a chimp we've added on another system so uh, that's sort of the human side of it that's so those those are the two which are in conversation or in conflict or in negotiation at different times. Yeah, so if we look at the, the, the brain as a, a load of little brains all pulled together, you know, you've alluded to this limbic system. If we look at some key structures, so the amygdala and also the orbital frontal cortex, just behind the eyes here, you know, those two structures are what we would classify as this independent, emotionally thinking machine that's just trying to keep us alive. So it's just looking for threat and danger and it's ready to react and keep us alive. You know, you've heard of this fight, flight, freeze response. Um, you know, that's inbuilt within that. And then you're right, we've got this, this frontal lobe, you know, the, the bit behind our forehead, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It's a big chunk of our mind, and this represents another thinking brain, which is able to think rationally, logically. I think some research papers call it the, the executive functioning part of our mind. It's able to do higher order stuff like problem solving, planning. Spreadsheets. <laughs> spreadsheets. Spreadsheets, exactly. I, st- I don't know if I've got that part of the brain. I can't do spreadsheets. The attention needed, the patience, the imp- impulse control needed to actually sit and do a spreadsheet. You know, if we were to get your brain under an MRI scanner, the blood's likely to be around this front area here. You know, and the minute you you do all your, your numbers and you press enter and it doesn't compute, that's when the blood goes to your chimp and you start panic. <laughs> that's the chimp then. Exactly. Yeah, that makes so much sense. <laughs> makes so much sense, mate. I, I, think, I think the chimp's out when I even go to... Uh, try and use spreadsheets on Google or whatever. I think the chimp's already out then. I think I need to uh, have a chat with it. But yeah, it, it makes sense, mate. And, and obviously the, the chimp is, I guess it's helpful. Is it helpful in a way? But it's just about managing it. Is is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's an important distinction that you've just made because, you know, I think to start with when we explain the chimp, it's, it's very easy to get the wrong impression and think, oh, Christ, this chimp's really bad. Like... You know, I've done the spreadsheet, it's not worked, and my chimp's come out and started to be frustrated and angry. I don't like to stigmatize the chimp. The chimp is just a part of our mind. Just a part of our mind that thinks emotionally. And at times it can be unhelpful what it offers. But it's just an offer all the same. 
I personally, this is only me, I don't, you know, you, you, you think of it how you like to think of it, but I personally like to think of it as, you know, you, when you've got them friends who, they're your friends, they're good people, you, you know you hang out with them for a reason, but sometimes they can just be a bit... A bit too much. Yeah, just like, what? That didn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you overreacting for? Yeah. Should be a... But they're your friends. And I think mm. that's what we've got. We've got a system in our brain that doesn't know what it's like to live in society. It doesn't get it. It lives by its jungle rules. And if we further stigmatize that part of the brain, if we further neglect it, don't accept it, don't try and work with it, we're making it more difficult to live in harmony with it. So would that be what you resist persists? Is that is that like a good way to look at it? I like that. I like that it's a rhyme, first and yeah. foremost. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I've obviously heard that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Steal that and brand that as my own. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The, uh, the Resist Persist Management book, I don't know, company. Just thinking about my own experience, how does awareness of, of the chimp, awareness of the human, how does that, how does that come to fruition in your work? Well, I think it's a good question. With with any athlete or or any individual, for that matter, that I work with, it's important first and foremost to understand, you know, what is it you're after? You know, what what is the outcome you're looking for? You know, is that a certain time you're doing on the track? Is that a performance? Is that just inner contentment? What what is that? Is it confidence? Because I think when we've got that outcome, what a lot of people come to me and say is, I'm finding it difficult because I'm finding myself get in the way of me achieving that. Of course, there's loads of other things in life that can get in the way of you achieving your outcomes, but a lot of the time, you know, it's, it's ourselves, we say. So I think that's the door opening to going, right, well, do you want to learn a bit about it then? Do you want to learn what's actually going on in your mind? Because using the chimp model, it gives us a bit of insight to say that actually, A, that's normal. That's completely healthy, what you're saying. Join the club. Our own mind gets in our own way of achieving what we want to achieve. But B, it gives us a framework to understand what we can do about it. Because at the moment, it's, it's all sounding very bleak. I've said to you, we've got a chimp that's very, very powerful, very, very strong. And if it was a fight between your chimp and your human, your human would never win. That's just the fundamental rules of the brain. You know, we can prove that. We can prove that, you know, if we don't do any planning, we don't do any forethought, and we just say, you know what, we're going to meet up at a coffee shop. You know, you, the human, could be saying, I just want a coffee, I'm going to stay clean, I'm not going to have anything. The chimp's already picked out what it's going to eat out of the the cake jar thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what the chimp model really, I mean, Steve himself has said this, what the chimp model should have been called, the chimp paradox, it should have been called the computer paradox. And what I mean by that is I'm introducing a third player now. When we look at the brain and the MRI scanner, we find that there are other circuits that are able to operate outside of control of the other two thinking brains. And these circuits don't think, they just do what they're programmed to do. And these parts of the brain represent stored memories, stored beliefs, habits, Athletes will be, you know, they'll resonate with the term muscle memory. These are things you don't think about, you just do. So there's a lot of structures in the brain that represent these computer areas. And if the computer is programmed well enough, it has the ability to override the chimp with speed. So let's say, to put that into sort of context, let's say we use that Costa Coffee example again. You know, we might have somebody saying, I want to stay faithful to my diet. I've got my outcome goals of achieving X amount of time at a run on the weekend, but I'm going to go meet a friend at, at a coffee shop. Obviously, other coffee companies are available. This isn't a, a cost of coffee. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> um, now, if before we go to the coffee shop, we consider what's going to be there, you know, there's going to be cake, you know, there's going to be temptation, you know, there's going to be a friend who potentially isn't on a diet and will eat and drink whatever they want. That's going to be a very vulnerable situation for your chimp. 
So now us, the human, have to think about, right, what do I want and what's going to help me get that? So it could be emotionally, you could be thinking, what are the thoughts and beliefs that are going to help me stay faithful to my diet? You can be thinking practically, you know, what are the behaviors and practical plans that I need to put in place so that I stick to it? You know, we can talk really complex, but a nice simple thing could be, you know what, I'm just going to order me coffee on the app and just pick it up, not even walk past the cakes. Or we can arrange to meet somewhere else. It doesn't have to be in a cost of, cost of coffee. So with a little bit of forethought, what you're doing there is you're programming your computer to override the chimp hijack that was going to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's the human part that's sort of putting in the coding for the computer there, do you think? Brilliant. That's exactly yeah. what's going on, yeah. Right, yeah, exactly yeah. And that's that the important sense. reflection. Yeah, so you'd sort of you'd you'd, you'd sort of want to help um, a person athlete or anyone uh, it may be to sort of accept and understand the chimp as a concept, to accept it in their life, and then to actually look at organizing the, sort of the humans' thoughts and beliefs and getting those getting those in sort of order, and then you'd look to use that to sort of code the computer, which sort of doesn't need any thought and it just sort of knows what it's doing on autopilot. Exactly, exactly. A really good example of that is what we're doing at the moment um, with a lot of the Olympic sports that we're working with. Obviously, I'm working with GB Taekwondo at the moment. You know, we've got some team days coming up and all those team days are going to be our program in the computer. So, you know, it's, it's a bit unfortunate that some athletes or some individuals may have a stigma towards looking forward and maybe contemplating adversities that could happen or mistakes or errors or things that could get in the way. You know, some people can be of that mentality of everything's got to go fine. I don't even want to talk about losing. That's weakness if I talk about losing. But what we're saying is if you want to perform optimally at the grandest stage, Based on what we've just said about how the mind works, it makes sense to think ahead and go, what could rock your chimp? What could pull your chimp out? What are the scenarios? What are the situations? And actually start to pre-program your computer to respond to it. You know, what if my coach isn't there when I need to perform? What if the, the, the time of my fight changes? What if somebody in the team gets covid you know, what if somebody at home, you know, goes through some relationship difficulties when I'm, you know, at the games? Would I want to be told about that? If I do, how would I respond to it? You know, there's a lot of forethought that can be gone into this. And the, the ideal is that when you're in the games, you've gone over these things so many times and you've memorized them and you've, you've got a plan that you believe in. But if those things happen now, on the surface, what that looks like is just resilience. So you're sort of forecasting what could happen and, and that sort of, because you've already thought about it, I, I completely get you where, where you'd think, no, we don't even want to put that into our minds because that might happen. And that's sort of, I don't know, as an athlete, I, I get a bit like that. I don't know if it's like magical thinking or, or whatever. You get a bit cautious of what you visualise or what you imagine, but there is that sort of, I wonder if it, it's sort of like imagining or sort of forecasting a possibility of the loss. So you already rehearsed it, you've imagined it, you've imagined what the actual negatives of it actually would be. Try not to drift off into complete sort of pandemonium and, and sort of like real tragic circumstances, just solely the, the actual circumstances that could happen. And you sort of take the power away from it, I imagine. Uh, so you sort of take the power away from the paralysis of, of what that loss could look like and what it could cause. And then it sort of links in with the underdogs, you know, because if, if, if underdogs are in a competition or, you know, a final and they've already neg neglected how bad it's going to be if they, if they lose because everyone sort of expects that anyway, 
then they can just go out and play freer and sort of more in alignment with with the best abilities. We just saw it with Man City, you know, I don't know what Man City and Chelsea in the Champions League final, the pressure of what that loss might be and the fact that no one's talking about it or, or even sort of considering it. Yeah, is, is am I on the right lines there? Is that sort of a similar sort of scenario? Yeah, I think you've I think you've summarised it really well. Um, obviously, there is the point to put in here around uniqueness. Obviously, what, what we're saying in principle is, if we can program the computer to expect the chimp to hijack and have a plan to manage it, we've got a better chance of remaining resilient. Obviously, this is an independent thinking part of our brain that is really strong, so it can and likely will hijack. Now, it's up for each individual to figure out what works best for them. I totally appreciate when some athletes might go, you know what, I've got my system of working. I'm not prepared to do that because I know what my chimp's like. It's just going to over-catastrophize, overthink, and that doesn't help me perform. And that's absolutely fine. This isn't a panacea. This isn't like I tell you something and it's all fixed. You have to do this. It's, It's all about different approaches, different horses, different courses. But I think... With some people, I have used this method of going, right, well, if your chimp is worried and concerned so much about the outcome not going your way, why not put that big fish on the table? Put it in front of you and let's talk about it. You know, what would that mean? What do you believe would happen if you did lose? What what do you believe it would say about you? What do you think the consequences are? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. This is a, a different one to throw at you, Ben. Yeah, but yeah, no problem. As an athlete myself, growing up, wanting to achieve, 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 I had quite a strong, and I still do, I've quite a strong inner critic. Where does the inner critic sit within this model of the chimp, the human, and the computer? What would you put the inner critic down to? Well, I think before I attempt to answer that, I think it's, it's worth asking you a question around what would you want to happen in your mind? Do, do you want to have an inner critic? Is that is that helpful? That's a good question, that. That's a really good question. It's sort of, I've been thinking about what that actually is in, in my life and what the inner critic plays a role in. I was thinking about this the other day. So, obviously, I stopped playing and the inner critic, I'm sort of weighing up the role that it has. I think, to a certain degree, it was... Well, highly useful coming up, trying to strive for improvement, sometimes proper perfection, but sort of like holding myself to a higher and higher standard. I guess is healthy to a certain amount, but then I think it can sort of probably cause frustration and sort of low states of mood, I imagine, a lot of time within that athlete role. But also I think going post-athlete role, I think it probably needs adapting or a shift in a sort of way because I need to have room to be able to enjoy myself and I'm not having to be at that standard if that makes sense it does yeah it it has its pros and cons doesn't it and um, and this is really common I see this a lot within elite athletes where they have this this thought pattern pop up which can be quite can be a bully at times Uh, it can demand high expectations and it can really keep persisting with that I think the reason why I asked you the question, because what that question does is it it helps people to separate themselves from the machine with which they live with. And what I mean by the machine is the computer and the chip. These are things that are independent to you, the human being. And if I was asked a lot of people, they'd say, actually, in an ideal world, getting out of bed, you know, I would like to be X, Y, and Z, right? And on that list wouldn't be... My, my worst enemy, my own critic. You know, I can see the benefits of that, but actually in terms of how I consistently want to be on a day-to-day basis, it would be something else. So for that, for me, tells me that this could be your chimp, your computer. It could be a combination of the both. You know, if we think about it, the chimp part of our brain is emotional, you know, and, and it's trying to protect us. And... The way it protects us sometimes isn't necessarily how we, the rational human, would want that to happen. You know, if you look at chimps in the jungle, it's going to use aggression. It's going to use physicality. It's going to use 
its presence and its power. And that's what it's doing potentially with its words towards you. You know, everyone listens to the critic. The critic gets the attention. Mm, So that's that's actually, you know, almost like an evolutionary advantage for that part of the brain to be talking to you in that way because it's going to get noticed. And also there's an argument to say it could even be a computer program. It could be a learned habit. It could be something that you've, your brain's always done. It could be how your environments talk to you at an early age and you've just adopted that. So it's a lot more nuanced. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. It's definitely sort of using that model to help yourself go through your own situation and bring awareness to your own situation. Because I, I, I was sort of confused as to think, well, is is that the chimp, you know, or is that just sort of the human sort of side of me that's wanted to develop and wanted to to get it right? And it, it's, it's only acting. It's not, it's acting in the way that it knows, really, and it? it's not, it's neither good or bad, I guess. So, yeah, that is uh, something to, to ponder on, I guess, something to ponder on. And, and with your work, mate, with, with Team GB Taekwondo, what does it look like in competition? Can you tell us about like the work that you do in competition, if it's before a fight, or um, is there anything that you, you've got to do in terms of conversations before fights or after fights? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and with every athlete, it's, you know, it's varied. It's varied. There's no sort of textbook of how you should be and how you should behave for each athlete. I really do take it on a sort of client by client basis. If we look at it compared to physical training, you know, a lot of the work gets done behind the scenes, really. You know, you don't get up to the day of competition and then go visit, visit your physio or your S&T coach and say, get my body ready. Like, you've been doing it for months, if not years. So a lot of the conversations, a lot of the, the psychological interventions that we might do with athletes to get them prepared to perform at their best will be done in conversations and sessions way prior to the to the competition. So you're planting the seeds, you're understanding what your own mental derailers might be, you know, where your own chimp and your computer might hijack you and get in the way of you being how you want to be in the performance arena. And then you're obviously practicing that. So, you know, we, we at Taekwondo will have test matches, we will have training days. This, not this Wednesday, I think it might be in a fortnight, we're doing like a simulation day where like we're practicing the actual Olympic day, what it's going to look like. And then when it comes to actually competition, again, the ideal would be that the individual reaches independence with their emotional management and they've got their own plans and strategies. You know, that some of them might have their own little textbooks that they can go back to and review and and go over their sort of checklist of things to remember. To those that maybe need a little bit of support, that might be a bit more of a team effort where you'll be at hand to have that conversation. You know, very typically, I worked in, lucky enough to work in elite golf for a number of years, um, going out on tour with the likes of Lee Westwood, Andrew Johnson. And a typical mental warm-up could involve having a conversation in the morning where the chimps are allowed to say whatever it wants to say. That's a strategy and a skill that we encourage people to do when they're trying to perform at their best. Very much like if you own a dog, for instance. You know how wily and energetic a dog can be, and and that's the reason why you take it on two walks a day. You've got got to let it off the lead for a little bit so that when it's in the house, it's nice and calm. So... You know, a a typical pre-competition strategy between a psychologist and an athlete may be sitting down with that athlete and saying, right, have at it. Say what you want to say. What's going on for you? So they they can open up, let out their chimp, let out the worries, concerns, emotions, to let it run its course. And and would you say that takes the power away from, from those concerns when they actually voice it? Well, neuroscientifically, when we look at the research, you know, when we allow free expression of our emotions, the blood is allowed to now go to other areas. And if you think about optimal performance, you know, these athletes, they rely on muscle memory. So optimal performance is not in the gym. It's not even in the human. It's in the computer. 
So it makes sense to say, look, if all the blood is in your chimp at the moment, get it out. And a lot of people, you can test yourself doing this. If you, if you feel your chimp's hijacking you, it's getting all the blood, you're irritable, you're not the ideal self, something's bugging you, challenge you just to sort of get a little egg timer in front of you and just write down a couple of pages of what's going through your mind. Speak it out and talk to someone about it. Just a quick one, guys. We have had two new counselors join team here at Mentality. If you are at a stage in life where you are struggling to manage your mind and it keeps affecting your happiness, it is time to do something about it. You can finally allow yourself the time to sit down with one of our Mentality counsellors who will understand what you are going through. They'll help you understand why you are struggling and they'll give you the tools to get back to being happy and the best that you can be. A lot of the time, we just need to clear up any unwanted thoughts and emotions so that we can show up in life the way that we want to. Mentality counselling is available in Yorkshire, Lancashire and the South East, including London. Sessions can be in person, face-to-face -face therapy or walking therapy. Alternatively, all counsellors can deliver sessions via Zoom. Go to mentality.co.uk forward slash counselling to start your journey. And what's your viewpoint on anger, Ben? I think anger gets a bad rap in society, really. I think, you know, obviously it can cause chaos if it's not sort of used in a, in a proper way or it's not sort of, as you say, let loose in a controlled manner. Like, how do you see anger in, in the world, in athletes or in, in the everyday person? And what's the best way to deal with it? Well, it's quite a varied question. I think it's a good one because we do come into contact with it, don't we? It might help to start by just realising what anger is. You know, it's, it's an emotion. And emotion is how the chimp part of our brain talks to us. So if we step away from the anger to start with, what we've got is a chimp trying to talk to us, trying to tell us something. And if we look at it through that lens now, that really helps us because a lot of the time when people present anger, it's not actually that they're angry at something. It might be something else. It might be that they're embarrassed. It might be that they're fearful. It might be that they're upset. And anger, especially for males, it can be a really easy and quite typical emotion to go to. But actually, if we, t if we spend time to look beyond the anger and understand what the real message is that the chimp is saying, in my opinion, we can, we can better help that individual to reduce it. So you think anger sometimes could be the byproduct of another emotion or feeling that they're not quite understanding or producing in the world as, as easy as that? I mean, a good example might be if... You know, elite athletes train for ages to get to a competition. The competition hasn't gone to plan and they don't get the outcome they wanted. A really common and healthy, you know, expression from the chimp following this would be to act, to be angry. But once you get talking and you let that chimp exercise, what starts to come out is that they're disappointed. They're not angry, they're disappointed with how that went and they want to they wanna understand what happened and learn from it. So it's just looking beyond that. And obviously, you know, what's important to acknowledge here is that the chimp model is not an excuse model. So I'm not saying it's absolutely fine for your chimp to get angry. It's absolutely fine for, you know, to be outwardly angry to people, verbally, physically assault. I don't mean that. If we go back to the analogy of the dog, if you have a dog that bites somebody, you can't just say, well, that's the dog. That's your dog. So it means it's your responsibility to train it. It's your responsibility to keep it on a lead. So you've got to, you've got to manage that. You've got to take ownership over it. So if you've got a chimp that does resort to anger quite a lot, I think it's, it's your responsibility to figure out what's going on for my chimp here. What does it perceive to be going wrong? Where does it think the threat or danger is? Mm. And a lot of the time... Is that something quite substantial? Is it something that you can come to terms with and accept it? Or do you sometimes find that it's actually something which it shouldn't be reacting to? Again, it's varied, isn't it? It could be both of what you've just said. I think this, this just signifies the importance of 
not doing this alone and, and maybe using somebody else, uh, a friend, a therapist, a psychologist, to, just to talk this stuff out because it really is hard to understand our own emotions. Like, I, I genuinely think that's why therapy and psychology is a, is a thing because if you're my client right now, I'm not emotionally invested in whatever you're going through. So I can engage my human relatively easy and start to understand what's going on. Whereas if you do that for yourself, it's another game, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, what do you find like the main crossover is that challenges an elite athlete might have as well as someone in, you know, everyday life? Do, do, you, do you find that there's sort of a theme at all? I mean, if we... If we drop the word sport at the moment and just sort of use it as just people, you know, I think people are unique, but there are some commonalities in the challenges that they present with. And if I was to sort of use that umbrella term of resilience, you know, basically a lot of people turn up and they'll present you loads of adversities, loads of things that life is offering them that they're finding difficult to process their emotions through. You know, if we, if we look at sport, that could be, you know, injury, uh, suboptimal performance, conflict with, you know, team members, coaches. It could be training, could be all sorts. But that's no different to an accountant that lives down the road. You know, he's worried about his performance. He's got a meeting with his boss coming up. I mean, a conflict in the team. It's building resilience that seems to be the common thread between a lot of the sessions that, that I tend to do. And it's what I mean by resilience is understanding number one, that our natural brain isn't resilient. So I think what's, what I'm trying to get out there is if we just look at our chimp, it's not built to respond to situations in a melodic and sensible and thought through way. It's built to react and to react fast, which, all right, in the jungle, that can help. You know, fight, fight, freeze kicks in when a jaguar approaches you. Pretty sensible to run away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty sensible to hide. Pretty se- Well, not sensible to fight it. Depends what you are. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, in, in, in reality, you know, it's not always useful to react in a fight, flight, freeze response in society. You know, it's much more helpful to be able to actually understand the impact it's having on our gym, have a plan to refocus us back into our robust state and accept and work with whatever the adversity is. Yeah, and if someone's in in conflict with themselves, I guess there's so many different examples for this and, and reasons for why, but... Can you provide an explanation of of what might cause conflict in someone? Is it a conflict between the systems? Is it a conflict of like sort of one system that's trying to work its way out of a situation? It's it's, it's quite interesting to think of the different sort of departments in our brain when we're on point, when we're happiest, or when we're most content. Is it when those systems are in alignment? Do you think? That could be one explanation of it, yeah. I think, you know, we've got, we've said we've got two independent thinking brains with different agendas. Um, and we said we've got a backup reference, which has, you know, stored memories and plans and, and, and habits. You know, and it could be argued that, you know, when we're in, when we're in harmony, when we're in, you know, when we're feeling happy, the systems aren't disagreeing with each other. You know, I think the example you used or the fish and chips, you know, there was a bit of back and forth, but in the end, your chimp was like, I want the fish and chips. The human was like, I want it as well, and I'm not that bothered with consequences. And he was like, we can deal with it. So, you know, interesting enough, if that was, you know, during your sport, if that was maybe, you know, a couple of days out from a competition, there probably would be conflict there because the chimp's going, I want the chips, and the human's going... I'm not sure that's the best thing for us right now. <laughs> that's true. That's so true. They wouldn't have even... I think my computer um, three years ago would have just said, no, I'm all right. 
Yeah. <laughs> just straight away, they've been out of my mouth, but now it's going, oh, hold on, hold on. There's a bit to go here. There's a bit to go here. Everyone loves fish and chips. You're in a different um, jungle, aren't you? You're in a different jungle, man. That's it. I like it. I like it. Definitely a different jungle. So a, a lot of the stuff that we do, Ben, with mentality is we we sort of bring people in to actually do a bit of work, do some work on themselves and sort of recommend practices of gratitude, um, meditation as well. You know, we sort of work with them to implement habits and try and get them to get habits to stick, basically, rather than trying to, to break records. We would look to maybe get a practice of, of one sentence on a night before you go to bed where it's where it's easy to do and meditation at a rate not of 20 minutes but of you know two minutes just something which gets them into the action of doing it and gets them into the habit of doing it and then a lot of it i guess is understanding that human part of it understanding the human sort of desires and wishes and wants and um, ambitions and then we sort of try and get an alignment you know from the actions and behaviors that we're going through through the world how how is meditation for example handy in sort of getting out the best version of yourself that makes sense does it does it fit with with the model that you're talking mindfulness in a way does that alert us and allow us to see the chimp a bit better that's sort of what i'm thinking trying to make up my mind i think it's sort of like lets us see all sorts of thoughts, I imagine, a bit clearer and without as much friction and stickiness to those thoughts and have to act on those thoughts. Yeah, again, I think that's a good question. They, um, they can complement each other very well. I think it's important to recognise as well that these are just different tools. They're just different tools and different doesn't mean bad. It means they can complement as well. Not precious about the chimp model, you know. If my my sort of philosophy as a practitioner is, you know, the chimp model is something I've got in my back pocket. If you resonate with it, great. If you don't, do what resonates with you. You know, if a lot of people out there, like I know, use mindfulness, use meditation, and it helps, crack on, crack on. I mean, for me, I think meditation uh, can be really useful. If you think about it, it's encouraging awareness of thoughts, it's encouraging that sort of non-judgmental attitude towards these inner thoughts. Actually, in terms of the chimp model, it's it's probably a, a tool that can help you start to separate yourself from the machine. You know, when you're meditating and you're, and you're noticing these criticisms that are coming through your mind, you know, from the little information I know about meditation, I'm not a, a skilled practitioner, not claiming to be, but having the ability to go, oh, that's interesting. There's some thoughts there that are quite negative. Just letting it, just seeing it go past you and almost seeing it as an offer and not jumping into it and going, that's me, I'm going to attach myself to that. So, yeah, I do see it complimenting. But as I said, like, it's whatever resonates for you. Yeah, that's so true. I think that's sort of like the, the main similarities or ways that I can see meditation being... Um, beneficial especially when you're looking at the chimp and sort of just trying to step out of its way and step out of its momentum and and knowing it a little bit better I like that sort of phrase where you're talking about separating from the machine because i think you, you sort of unless you you do do the work to understand your chimp and your human and your computer then literally you are sort of hostage to that machine or, or you sort of victim to whatever activities go on whether that be good or bad so it's a really really good way to look at it and i think the roadmap certainly does help and i think as as you probably agree ben i think guys definitely have sort of a an agreement with themselves to resist those thoughts and and the negative sort of side of it a bit more than the average sort of person or, or even females to be honest I just think we, we, we're sort of built up to I guess in the chimp sort of way to beat your chest and not, not give in really but I think almost it's it's like you, well I think you just have to accept it and give in to to what momentum or to what wave of thoughts that you might have too um, I think guys can give ourselves a bit of a harder time I'd say in terms of, of, 
of mental health anyway do you find that there's a bit more work obviously do you work with females and men do you find that it's it's you've got to put a bit more of a shift in for guys or um i don't suppose i've come across that because in my own personal philosophy is to, to almost not look at the male females and just to look at them as people with machines because i've met loads of to give respect i've met loads of females who you know struggle to acknowledge and accept the emotions that their chimp is offering them and, and choose to manage it and equally i've met males who you know are very in touch with their chimps and they're able to be aware and to accept and to work with it so it, it is a wide spectrum but yeah i think i've met many a uh, many an athlete who unfortunately find it really difficult to accept and work with their chimp and it's, it's it's such a shame and i know you know what you referenced there about being a hostage to your machine like a lot of people can go a long time in life actually not separating themselves from the machine and almost believing that they are everything that this machine reacts like which can have you know gross consequences for people's self-esteem you know looking yourself in the mirror and saying am i a good person and because your chimp's hijacking you all the time and you can't get control over it, you can't manage it, thinking to yourself, I'm not a good person because I constantly let my emotions out and, you know, they're unhelpful. Mm. And so, like, self-doubt it, it is, it might, it might be too hard to, to uh, answer straight down the line, but the self-doubt, would that be the chimp, do you think? Again, with this, it's, it's not it's not a sort of fast and loose sort of answer to everything. I think... Yeah, black and white. You've got to ask the question, do I want this? Is it helpful? So if if your answer to that is yeah, then, you know, that's your human talking. If it's no, which a lot of people would say, is that's likely your machine talking. You know, because I get the human in a lot of people would like to be... Would, would like to reflect on what they've done and to learn. But in terms of being critical, what's the outcome that we're going to get if we judge ourselves and we're critical to the point of making us, our chimps feel bad? You know, is that going to serve to help us learn the lesson, progress and move on? So I think we have to think about the outcome we're after as well in terms of self-doubt. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. And just just for anyone listening to this, like, what what's the steps for someone who who's hearing this and going, all right, I won't mind having a bit more information or taking the first steps to manage manage everything, manage my mental health, but also to sort of train my mind to better deal, to better live successfully, and to to be more happier. Well, I think what we've covered a lot of today is insight. And understanding, you know, to, to better manage the mind that you've got, I think it helps to start with looking at what have I got? You know, what am I working with? What are the rules to how a mind works and how, how can I start to shift it in my favour? So the chimp model is one example. It's an access model to give you some insights. There's a lot of other approaches and philosophies of practice out there that you can, you can turn to. I know there's a lot of self-help books, there's a lot of podcasts that can help gain insight into how we operate and what motivates our behaviours. Aside from that, and I don't want it to be a throwaway comment because I know a lot of people say it, but I want it to be taken seriously. And that when I I say just talking about it, hopefully today we've given you a little bit of insight into neuroscientifically what I mean by that. Like talking about it helps. Yeah, and that's you mentioned thing. about the sort of the male stigma and the the difficulty that some males can, can find in, in talking about our emotions. But what we're saying is unless we let the chimp have that free expression, we find it difficult to tap into the more reflective parts of our brains that are going to help deal with the problem long term. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's such a big point as well. Like you... you Earlier on in this conversation, you mentioned the talking, talking the chimp out, talking the concerns, talking the worries, the frustrations, the anger, 
maybe. And how that actually, you can see that neuroscientifically on a scan, moves the blood from that area that's doing all that activity into another place. It's a literal shift in it. It's not just a a sort of a hope that you move into a different state. It's a literal shift of blood into another part of the brain, isn't it? It's no coincidence why a lot of talking therapy, you know, the therapist might not actually say that much. And the, the client walks out of the room thinking, I feel like a million dollars. <laughs> hey, you yeah. have someone listen to you for an hour and you've just, you've been allowed to say whatever you wanted. That's so true. That's so true. I, um, you laugh at this. I you might not laugh at this, but I, uh, <laughs> I, I, um, unconsciously maybe, unconsciously sort of, um, went to shift the anger, frustration out of my life and that part of the brain. I was so angry. One day I was so angry last year and um, I needed to smash something up. I felt like I needed to smash something up. And instead of doing anything, smashing anything up in the house, uh, my partner quite um, kindly guided me to some plant pots that weren't being used. And I hurled them at the garage. <laughs> and, it, and it felt so good. It felt so good. Maybe I could have talked, talked about it, talked it out. But I've done a lot of talking and um, I'm used to playing and flipping, smashing into bodies every Friday night, playing rugby league, so I needed to uh, use a bit of physical exertion. Yeah, I get that. I get that. There's an element of catharsis that comes through doing that. I think maybe this is the time to sort of just, with people listening, obviously what I'm not condoning is picking up <laughs> and throwing them a rifle every time. Don't do it all. It was at home, but don't do it all. <laughs> no, but I think it's a good but, point because... In that moment, for whatever reason, I'm just going to alter your language a little bit just to help you out there. Um, your chimp was angry. You know, if we think about it, Stevie wasn't angry. You know, Stevie's not getting out of bed at the morning, every morning saying, I would love to be angry today. You know, for whatever reason, Stevie's chimp was angry and it's offering him a lot of heated thoughts and feelings. So... In that moment, of course, behaviourally, it's easy to, to exert that anger onto something. And I appreciate it's probably a lot more challenging to verbalise it. But if we can start, start to make steps to verbalise what our chimp is going through, it can have the same impact. You know, only only a couple of days ago, actually, I was talking about this with a, a parent uh, who's a colleague of mine. And we were talking about how can we encourage emotional literacy at an earlier age? And what I mean by that is basically better understanding your chimp. You know, better understanding the messages it's giving you. Like, what is the emotion he's talking to me with here? What is the thing that he thinks is going on? Um, and she, she's got a, a small child. I think it was like three, four years old. And she's created this little wheel with like just a handful of emotions. So now every time the, the I mean, all the child can relate to is the behavior. So the child goes, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just want to kick and scream. But now the process is helping that child to not only realize when the chimp is out because their behaviors are showing it, but also go to the wheel and verbalize it. What is it? Is it, is it I'm sad? Is it I'm disappointed? Is it, is it I'm embarrassed? Am I frustrated? And, and that over time, you're myelinating that path in the computer. You're better understanding your chimp so you can better manage it in the future. So I think, you know, I was looking at that as a fully grown adult thinking, that's brilliant. I, I should get loads, like a wheel every room. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I tell you what, that, 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 that child's going to be very uh, emotionally intelligent when he's that's older. The that's the hope. Yeah. We can only fight, can't yeah. we? Yeah, that's it. That's it. And it's, it's, it's already accepting it. It's already sort of vocalizing or sort of understanding where the source of, emotion is coming from and why so that's quite big it's quite big i was just thinking as, as we were talking then like you know when when you think of someone on the field or an athlete on the field and that you sort of see that they've quote-unquote lost control it's sort of insinuating that they've lost control of that human part of them in it and it's sort of saying that they've slipped into that that chimp periodically which is is, is quite funny it's quite funny to think about it's um we we sort of I guess in society we're expected to to be in a in a human all the time, but it's very easy to um to slip back into that chimp 
and I guess what you're doing by understanding and looking for that source of, of emotion, you just you just sort of you just sort of making friends with it. You just sort of um, being in a better relationship with it, so it doesn't poke its head out every all the time. Yeah, and I know I know I'm being pedantic here when I say this, but I think you've raised a really good point there around judgment. I, I get it's the the common tongue to say in that moment. You know, they've lost control, you know, they've let themselves down, or they've done something wrong. You listen to these phrases; they're quite stigmatizing. And if we're not careful, you know, the, the way the mind works is it listens, it interprets, and it lays down memory. So potentially that person in that moment is not only just lost control of their chimp, they've been hijacked, which is healthy. It's expected. You know, you're living with a machine that's five times stronger than you. Like, you're not always going to have full control over it. It's, it's forever a work in progress. So not only, you know, have they tried all of that, but now they've got this label of, you know, they've lost control. Like, like it was their fault. So again, I think one thing that the chimp model really does help people to do, it's not an excuse model to say it's fine, but it's an understanding model to say, let's actually understand what's happened here. The, the person got hijacked. And that's normal. We can learn from that. Yeah. And and then on the other side of it, they don't want to, you know, after being coined to lost control or um, let themselves down, they don't want to tip into, I guess, embarrassment and shame then, do they? That's, that's sort of what you want to prevent, I guess, from doing this sort of work. There's, there's no shame. You know, you live with a machine that you inherited. You had no say in it. Do you know what I mean? Like, you didn't get to sit down and decide what colour eyes you had. You just got it. You know, you, the thing, you didn't get to sit down and choose what sort of chimp you had or what sort of environment you were subject to when you were a young child and what beliefs were in, in place. But you have to say over looking at what you have and learning how to manage it now. That is the difference. It's going, we can understand it, but it's your responsibility now. Wow, we're putting the world to rights here, right? <laughs> That's true, mate. That's true. It's um, I, I, I completely agree. I think it's I think it's it's important to understand that you have got some governance or you have got some sense of um, agency when it comes to shaping and changing the way that you show up in the world. And a lot of that is understanding and, and accepting and then sort of shifting towards a more controlled version of yourself. I don't know, shifting to a happier and, and more content version, I'd say. The, the 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 powers there, and I guess it's it's just doing the work in it, just like everything else. Yeah, and this is where it relates well to any physical skill that, you, that you're trying to adopt in sport. You know, chimp management is an emotional skill. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes reflection. It takes planning. And to be brutal, to give you all the caveats, to give you all the asterisks at the bottom of the contract. It takes a lot of mistakes. It takes a lot of mistakes. Like you weren't at the level you were in rugby by getting everything right. You know, I don't know your career, but I know you made a hell of a lot of mistakes. <laughs> mm, yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit. I just had that in a crate come in and go, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I've said quite an edgy sentence. The chip's gonna take the lead in that one. But please let your human know that all I'm actually saying there is like mistakes happen. They need to happen for people to become excellent at what they do. That's it. You better That's get in the trade, don't you? That's it. And what a way to end it, Ben. Um, thanks for thanks for coming onto the podcast, mate. Showing us that roadmap, sharing some of your insight and some of the practice that you've done in elite sport, but also with people as we said you know as, as we said you've um, you've really helped lay it out there and it's um, it's nice to see it's really nice to see that, that we have got such an agency and governance when it comes to it so thanks for spending 
spending your Thursday afternoon with us, mate. It's been great. Not a problem. Been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Stevie. Cheers, bud. Hope you enjoyed that podcast with Ben, guys. After listening to that podcast, it's been a while since we recorded it, but listening to it again, it made me feel less tension. It made me feel a little bit better about life. It made me feel like there's a reason for all the crazy and random thoughts that we can get as men. And to be able to have the science laid out in front of you, to be able to have an understanding from a sports psychologist who has worked with everyone under the sun, especially in optimal performance, to be able to talk about how freely speaking about your thoughts and your emotions, how that literally shifts blood from the part of your brain where worry and fear and concern takes place to another place, how that enables us to get on with life, how that enables us to feel better about the world and to become who we really want to be. It was an amazing reminder and this podcast is a good one, but it's also a good one to show that if you are someone who needs support, if you are someone that needs to be able to speak about your life, if you need to speak openly, if you need to find a way forward, then we have Mentality Counselling. Mentality Counselling is here for you to do just that. And you can go to mentality.co.uk forward slash counselling to take it upon yourself to enter that arena and to make your life the one that you want.